I want to teach today out of Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Romans chapter 4. I'm real slow on the front side, so just, just bear with me because I like the word of God. And uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. I'm in the NIV translation. When you find that on your device or in your tablets or your hardcover Bible or soft Bible, rest on your feet and let's read this word together. Romans 8, Romans 4, verses 18 through 22. When you find it, shout hallelujah. Yes, y'all said it. Shout it. When you find it, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, now you remember how you sounded, right? That, I, that's my favorite thing to say, shout hallelujah. I still, I'm new school, but I got that old school left in me. Shout hallelujah. So, yeah, I want to hear you shout it. Don't say it, all right? Romans 4, 18 through 22. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offsprings be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. I want to talk to you today from a simple topic, topic called the unwavered, the unwavered. Father, we thank you for this moment in time. We thank you for this church. We thank you for these leaders. Bless us. Sanctify our minds and clutter our minds that we may hear what you have to say in Jesus' name. Everybody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I want to talk about the unwavered. You may be seated, the unwavered. In the book of Romans, Paul is addressing the Roman believers, Jew and Gentile. And he shows God's continued faithfulness. And as he's doing this, he's beginning to show them uh, the ancientness about this book and about how Israel's ancient past plays a role in where they are now. He shows them how they came from slavery into sonship, from the law into faith. And what's interesting is that the law couldn't fix much. It couldn't defeat death and it couldn't bring life. So Paul writes about this new covenant. And while he's writing about this new covenant about righteousness, it's righteousness by faith, which is now not just available for the Jew, but it's available for everyone in this new era. He discusses Abraham, listen to this, being justified first, circumcised later. The law wasn't instituted until several centuries later. Now listen to that. Several centuries later, but Abraham, some kind of way, taps into faith, scoops over the law, but taps into faith before the law was ever given. All right? He taps into this faith, but watch this. He starts responding to the promise before faith. He starts responding to the promise before the law. Interesting. His faith came first, then works then circumcision, then the law. Why is this critical? Because this post-pandemic church at large, as it forcefully advances, it cannot continue to substitute its preferences for God's promises. When it comes to humanity, listen to me, I'm going really slow. Many may come to church that don't have our traditions, but that doesn't mean they don't have his justification. Y'all hear me? 
because the church cannot justify. The church, we have our traditions, but we cannot justify, all right? His death and his resurrection is what justifies. If you look at Romans 5.25, Romans 4.25, it says, He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So in this post-pandemic church, we must be careful that we don't run away the church with our traditions and, our, and, and, and the things that we've done that have made the word of God none effect. Because it is God that justifies, not the deacon and not your rules. I, no, I got no help in here today. This entire notion of justification is what created the separation in Catholicism. Catholicism and Protestantism, when Martin Luther concretized his doctrine uh, of justification, emphasizing the work of God within man by the merits of Christ, imputed it to him. He, was, he said he, 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 he was trying to get the Catholic Church to understand it has nothing to do with your religious observances. That's not what makes a man justified. He said it has nothing to do with him coming in and out uh, 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 of the curtain to talk to you for him to be justified. But justification was an inner working. It was an inner working that God had to do with that man. So he pinned his 95 thesis on the wall and begins to talk about justification being the work of God. And when he does that, pow, it separates the Catholic, the Catholicism or Catholicism. And now we have Protestants, which is what you and I are. This huge gap was created all because of our belief system. This is critical. Again, Abraham tapped into faith. Listen to me. Before there was a law, whatever given. And he responds to that promise. Why is that important and why am I repeating that? You're not in faith because you're hearing the word. Faith come by hearing. But that doesn't mean you're in it because you heard it. You're not in it until you respond to it. We all hear it. Even Satan hears it. But you are in faith when you start corresponding to what God is saying. This is how he taps into faith early before faith even comes on the scene because he begins to respond to God when God says, leave your kindred, leave your country, he responds. Most of us have a difficult time responding when God speaks something so big to us. When God says something beyond our scope, but yet we repeat what you just said. We want him to go beyond our expectations. We want him to go beyond our mind. But it's according to the power that worketh within you. You can have the dream. You can have the expectation. But if you don't have the power, you won't see any results in your life. It is the power that causes you to trust God at his word and every now and then we become it comes difficult for us to trust God when God tells us to do something that's beyond the scope so we'll say we're in faith because we heard it but we're really not there because we won't respond to it look at somebody and tell them I'm responding this year I'm not just going to sit in here and listen to the preacher I'm going to respond I'm going to respond that is what separates you from the normal individual that you respond to the ridiculous that you respond to what God said I'm not just going to sit there and listen but I'm going to try God I'm going to test God that's what he said in Malachi test me in this prove this I'm trying to get you to understand it that when you get ready to really walk in faith you're going to have to re Respond. It is the responding, it is the responding, it is the responding that separates you. It is the responding that separates you. Hearing is important. You're in faith when you start responding to what you hear. That means then faith is a priority. It is believing and trusting in someone or something. And there is no one more trustworthy than God. When he tells you something, hearing him is the beginning, but trusting him by doing his word is the responding. Now Bertrand Russell says, faith is a conviction which cannot be shaken by contrary evidence. 
that when I begin to truly respond in faith, you know you're in faith because everything coming against you looks opposite of what God told you. That's when you know you're responding in faith because you're trying to respond. You want God to tell you something and then you want God to make it easy. You want God to clean out all the crooked places. You want God to get rid of all your enemies. You want God to make it easy. But God said, that's not faith. I need you to learn how to walk in the valley of the shadows of death. I need you to learn how to walk when the enemy is barking at you. I need you to learn how to look the devil in his face and tell him the options look great, but God looks better. I wish I had a witness in here today. You've got to learn how to walk by faith. The just shall live by faith. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we're going to truly be in faith, then we must respond. Are you here with me? I got to build my case. I want to spend some time on belief systems. Because if you're going to truly respond, if you're going to be unwavered, then your belief system is critical. It is just as important what you believe as it is that you believe. See, your belief system is formulated over time. It started when you was a little baby and you heard how your mother talked. You heard how your mother prayed. You heard how your brother preached or how your pastor preached. You heard how they prophesied. You heard the type of preaching that you, all of that matters. How your mother or father was in church on Sunday and how they responded to crisis on Monday. All of that is a form of how you believe. Because some of you had parents that gave God glory on Sunday, but then they were crushed by what they were going through on Monday. And the Hikama Honda was only there at 9 a.m. And the Run DOC was only there at Sunday night. But then some of you had some mothers and grandmothers that was like mine, that when hell broke out, they found the back room. And they would be screaming, oh, Jesus, I'm on the big coast of Baya. You in there trying to do homework. I'm on my on the big she broke coast of Baya. Have your way, Lord. All of that is a part of your belief system, how they talked, how they begin to deal with loss. I remember as a young boy, when, 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 when my family would lose stuff, they would say, I didn't lose it. I just sold it. Now, to the average person, that, that you're crazy. That's stupid. But they were teaching me perception, understanding that if I sold a thing, I would never lose it. Because you always reap what you sow. But if I confess that I lost it, then I would start losing my mind trying to find it. Because it was very important to me. So I would just start saying when I lost stuff, I sold that into somebody's life. And whoever's life that, that landed in, Father, we thank you for it right now. That it will return back unto me 30, 60 to 100 fold. Because I understand that seed time and harvest will continue till Jesus come. So next time you lose something that's valuable to you, just say, Lord, hold on. I sow that in the name of Jesus and may it come back to me 1,000 fold. Somebody shout hallelujah. Your belief system is set up by the voices in your head. Dominant and recessive voices, big voices, small voices. You have the voice that always speaks, the bold voice, and then you have the small voice, the one that rides with you all the time, that questions everything. I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe I'm not good enough. The, 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 your belief system, that, that stuff is carved into your life. So it's critical uh, when you go to the right church because the right church will teach you how to believe, will teach you how to flush out stinking thinking. It will teach you how to deal with brain trash. It will teach you how to flush out People who bring in negativity that you may be attracted to. And the only reason why you accept it is because you're so addicted to them. And you invited addiction. 
addiction into your life that has polluted your living because you love it. I wish I had a witness here. You didn't used to believe like that till you met him. You didn't used to believe like that until you met her. She perverted how you think. She has you questioning everything that you think. Ripped you away from how you do things. Ripped you away from how your family teaches you. And now you're in a position where you don't know you. You remember the word, but you don't remember yourself. And now you're mad because everybody's trying to remind you of the woman of God and the man of God that you were five years ago. And you feel like they're bringing up your past. They're just trying to stir up your mind and tell you who you are in God to get you to understand that Satan has desired to sift you, but God said I prayed for you. Wish I had a witness in here. Look at somebody and tell them God's been praying for you. Regardless what's going on in your mind, God's been praying for you. Come on, shout hallelujah. You will only rise to the level of your belief system. You will not go any higher than you believe. So if you don't believe you can go higher, you're absolutely right. You will never go higher than what you believe. And point number one I want you to write down in your notes is staple in your belief system. Staple in your belief system. Why is that critical? Because the text says that against all hope, Abraham stayed in hope and believed. See, building hope into your belief system is a matter of choice. Some people are afraid of hope for the fear of being let down. But the scripture says that hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Yeah, that's what it says. So people would rather stay away from hope because of the possibility that could come from being let down. The possibility of what could come from uh, uh, possibly not achieving or not receiving. And so you will block yourself from uh, relationships that could bless your life because of the potential of what could possibly negatively happen to you. And so you're stuck in cycles of fear, keeping yourself from building community all because you believe that you possibly could be hurt. We've got to learn how to break that and you still got to respond regardless of the fear. You've got to respond regardless of the walls that you have built up. My prayer for you today, that some of you through this transition will break some walls. That you will kick down some walls and expect God to do something supernatural because you have been caught in safety of one system but God's trying to explode you in your life. But the only only way you're going to explode is unless you kick the wall down. The preacher's not going to kick it down and God's not going to kick it down. God says you respond in faith. You need to staple in hope because the Bible says that against all hope. Oh, y'all not hearing what he said. He says against all hope, he stayed in hope and he believed. You've got to learn how to believe when everything in front of you is opposing what God is saying to you. Now that, that alone is a war. Because if you're around traditional people, they're going to tell you those are the signs that God is telling you, you in, you're not in his will. You're not in the Lord's will. Do you see all of that that's happening to you? He's trying to talk to you. You dummy, even Jesus, when he was baptized, the devil took him up into the wilderness. You will go through a season where you're going to have to learn how to respond from what you stapled into your belief system. That word staple means fixed, attached, what I have put together. If you don't stick something in your belief system, then when you get out of the world will crush you and the only thing you will do is keep retreating, going back and forth and that spirit of not being stable has to be broken. So we must staple in our belief system understanding that there will be times when it does not look good but that does not mean it's not good. 
Oh, I wish I had a witness in here. Somebody say, it don't look good. It doesn't look good, but it's still good. It's still all good. How is that? Because I've got a God that's been sticking with me closer than any brother closer, than any sister closer, than any mother closer, than any brother. He stuck himself with me. How close did he do it? Greater is he that is within me. Uh, that's how close I'm sticking to you is that I'm inside of you I'm not going to just walk alongside of you but I'm going to be inside of you I'm stuck in your nature I'm stuck in your mind I'm stuck in your spirit and you've got to recognize that if you would just settle down even against all hope you can respond in hope are y'all still here with me come on shout hallelujah I told y'all I was slow. Too much anticipation without seeing anything manifest. It creates more than agitation. It develops sickness and it develops departure from the church. Because the person is like, I keep doing this and ain't nothing happening. I keep trying this and ain't nothing happening. I keep doing this, and, and, and that is the hope deferred. And so when you, when you live in that hope deferred, and you start getting sick, but what you don't recognize is God's building your stamina. Yeah, God's building your stamina, and God's building you to understand how to resist the enemy, how to live in warfare, how to break the hand of the enemy. See, the thing is, we, 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 want, we want to come to church and let God do all the fighting. Yeah. We want to come to church and let the choir do all the praise. We want to come to church and let the dance team do all the dancing. We want to come to church and let the praise team do all the praising. Every now and then, we ought to just fire the praise team and hire you and see what will happen if we just depend on you. See, that's what you can see. You can only depend on you when you wake up in the morning. There will be no Bishop Matthews in your house. There will be no Prophetess Matthews in your house. There will be no tapes and CDs in your house. So you need to come up in this church as if there is no praise team and tell hell, I came in praising. I woke up praising. I came in the house understand. I don't need nobody to warm me up because I'm already warmed up. Have I got a witness in here? Lean over and find somebody that will praise God and tell them, neighbor, I came in warmed up. Tell them if you cold, get away from me because I'm looking for God to do something supernatural in my life and not just supernatural, but I'm looking for him to do something in the natural. I want him to give me a raise. I want him to change the company. I want him to fix my friends. Somebody shout hallelujah. Be seated. Hope is found in the book of Romans more than any book in the New Testament. Paul links hope with faith very, very often. We know that faith is the substance of things hoped for. The scriptural context is distinguished from secular optimism in that it is grounded in what God has done. It's not just being optimistic that things will be all right, but I'm hoping because he is the hope of glory. Yeah, I'm hoping because this hope is Built on God. So I don't have to be optimistic about the day. I just need to be in God. I wish I had a witness. And if I can be in God, then I know everything is going to be all right, regardless of what the day looks like. Now, because of Calvary, we can believe that God can work through any types of odds. And you have to keep Calvary in your mind. Because when you keep Calvary in your mind and you see how bad it was for Jesus, then you can understand that no matter what you're going through, it never looked like what Jesus went through. And if Jesus could survive those odds against all hope, he carried the cross. They whipped him across his back. They nailed him in his hands. They nailed him in his feet. 
pierced him in his side, placed a crown of thorns on his head, and the man died. And if Jesus came back from that, there is nothing that you're going through that you cannot come back from because your hope is built on what God has already done. Have I got a witness in here? Lean over and tell somebody you can come back from anything. I don't care if you've been broke. I don't care if you filed bankruptcy. I don't care if you've been divorced. I don't care if you've been raped. I don't care if you've been put out. Whatever it is, God can bring you back from anything. Lean on somebody and tell them I'm coming back. Oh, I felt the Holy Ghost on that one right there. Tell them I'm coming back. Tell him I'm coming back right now. Tell him I feel a comeback in my chest. I feel a comeback in my foot. I feel a comeback in my heart. I feel a comeback in my mind. Somebody that's coming back, open your mouth and say, I'm on my way back. Glory to God. Be seated. Be seated. Abraham believed. Against all hope. I don't even see the clock. Where is it? It's right there. Big as daylight. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I said, I don't see the clock, and it's the size of Jesus. <laughs> Abraham believed against all hope. And so when I hear that, and when you hear that, you need to hear how resilient you can be, okay? And this is why your hope has to be stapled in because when you staple it in, you learn how to fight back because your hope is bound up inside of you because when you start struggling and start dealing with stuff, you're working from the inside. And if your insides are focused on the chaos and focused on the climate, then you'll pull from the experience instead of pulling from the power that God has placed inside of you. And all of that affects your belief system. I want you to walk out of here today knowing that I may have a lot going on, but whatever I have going on, God is bigger than what's going on. God is bigger and I've got hope to survive it. My church has hope to survive it. My family has hope to survive it because you can function once you recognize what you have inside of you. You've got to learn how to deal. Let's watch this. Watch this. You've got to learn how to deal with name over need. What does that mean? God tells Abraham I'm going to make you father of many nations. So he gives me the name. I'm going to make you a father. But he has no child. That's a need. I got to learn how to live with this name that you gave me. Without allowing the need to see it manifest to validate that you said it. Oh, y'all wish y'all were here with me. Because people will try to rob you saying you can't be in God because what he said has not manifested yet. And so you got to learn how to just walk with the name. Glory to God. Wish I had a witness in here. You got to learn how to just be what he calls you. You just got to learn how to be saved and sanctified. You just got to be learned how to be the father with no children. You got to learn how to be the mother with no baby. You got to learn how to be the business owner with no business. You got to learn how to be the school teacher with no students. You got to learn how to be the principal with no school. You got to learn how to be before you become. Oh, I wish I had a witness in here. The name over the need. I got to learn how to walk in his name. And, 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 and this is normal. Be seated. Y'all be seated. This is normal. Am I okay, y'all? This is normal because whenever Jesus sends out the disciples, he just told them, do everything. In my name. Yes, sir. Oh, my God. On, so the, the, the covenant with God is learning how to understand that the name is enough. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
The name is enough. The name, the name, the name is enough. The name is enough. I want you to look at somebody and tell them the name is enough. The name is enough. Well, I, I, I want to really preach, but I got to teach this lesson. I wanna, the name, the name, the name. Tell somebody else the name is enough. The name is enough. Once you really grow up, once you really mature, you'll understand the most powerful thing on the planet is your name. Glory to God. That's why Satan will try to rob you with your debt and have you not be able to pay because your name will be crucified because of how you behave in your money. So if you can ever learn how to get your money right and to get your name right and to get your mind right, your name will change the game. Wish I had a witness in here. Look at somebody and tell them my name's about to change the game. Yeah, my name, my name, my name, my name. Wouldn't it be something if you could just tell your kids, go down there and tell them Pearl sent you. Glory to God. Go down there and tell them Joel sent you. Go down there. Y'all know people like that? I know people like that. Go down there and tell them Joel sent you. Go down there and tell them David sent you. I prophesy to 50 of you that your name's going to be your cash. Your name's going to get the deal done. Your name's going to kick open the door. Your name's going to make it happen. Your name, your name, your name. Somebody shout out, God, do it in my name. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, I believe that that's going to be the next miracle for your church. The next miracle for your church is that you're going to have power members. Glory to God. Yeah. You're going to have power members. I'm talking about you. Or maybe I'm talking about the ones that's coming because these don't want it. But you're going to have power members. You're going to walk in the bank and they're going to say, how you doing, Mr. Johnson? I'm doing good. Amen. Praise the Lord. And you're going to be in sweats and tennis shoes. You're not going to have to put on no suit and look good because your name looks good. I wish I had a witness here. Tell somebody my name. It's in my name. It's in my name. I'm in my name. And God said if you do it in his name, he'll give you the credit. Have I got a witness in here? If you do it in Jesus' name, I'll fix your name. Somebody give him credit. Glory! Learn how to deal with name over the need. The name over the need. Because it is the need. Be seated, please. It is the name over the need. I got 16 minutes. It is the name. It is the name. It is the name. We get caught up in the need to see it happen. And when God gives us a promise, and when God tells us, this is what I want to do in your life, The promise is not your job. The patience is. Your belief system, your belief system. That's why it's got to be stapled in. You got to understand, when God promises it, you can't go into overdrive trying to make it happen. Your job is to be patient on what God is trying to do. Because let me tell you something. God, the worst thing to do is for you to make it happen and move into a season that was not yours. Because when you move into the season that was not yours, you forced your way in. And you'll have to manipulate your way in. And you'll have to manipulate your way to stay in. But when God moves you in, it is because God has a unique way of strategically removing people and then placing somebody in a position that knows your name. I wish I had a witness in here. And if you don't do your job to keep your name clean, that when he moves the pieces like chess, he'll put people like Matthews in place and they'll be there in a new season and the first thing they'll think about is your name. Somebody say patience Patience. is not just a virtue. virtue. It's my responsibility. responsibility. Am I I helping your church? Are we okay? It's not just a virtue. It's your responsibility. Well, trials... And tribulations 
work your patience. <laughs> Sir. That's Bible. Trials and tribulations work your patience. So when people tell you you're not in the will of God, wait, 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 let, me, let me find out what the Bible says. The Bible says the trials and tribulations work my patience. I am absolutely in the will of God because God is trying to prune me. He's, ty- he, he, he's trying to get me ready because most of you, if God moved you into your season now, you would drag all them nobodies that you should have let go a long time ago. So God wants to prune you so you can get rid of all them low down Negroes that you have allowed into your life, all them boyfriends and girlfriends that you still hanging on to that you need to let go of so God can do something new in your life. Are you still here with me? Be seated. So God called him the father of many nations. His job was not to work the promise. His job was to work his patience. And you saw, if you know his story, his wife. Notice she's not the mother of many nations. She didn't get that title. Now, I'm not against women. I love women. I think women are the best thing God made on the planet. But Sarah did not get the woman or the mother of many nations because she was connected to Abraham. So that tells you that the miracle or the promise is not about DNA. The promise is about desire and the promise is about you being determined to respond to God. All right, are you here with me? Because what she did was she said, listen here, let me, let me help you out. Let me help you and God out. Why don't you take my girl Hagar Sleep with her, let's have a baby, and we can help God out. Abraham was like, yo, that's a good deal. (laughs) You're giving me permission to be a man. So he does his thing. And when he does his thing, she manipulated it. And because she manipulated when they came out, the Bible says that one day she just was just watching them. Just watching how she was walking in the tent. You know how y'all do. You just walking. Hey, God ain't doing nothing but what you told her to do. And because you told her to do it, you ain't really looking at how she walking. You looking at what you gave him permission to do. All she was doing walking. And see, some of y'all, you can register with what I'm saying because some of the... I almost cussed. (laughs) There are some haters in your life that just hate how you walk. When you come in, they hate your appearance. They hate what you represent. They hate where you're going. They hate what you look like. And all you're doing is... I wish I had somebody. When you find out you got somebody that just hates you for how you walk, what you you know what you need to do? Walk some more. I wish just... And then put some in that thing. Step out and walk with it. Oh, I'm going to prophesy that to you right now. I need at least a hundred of you to just stand up and take about six steps because you're walking in the destiny and you got haters that don't like how you walk, but everything you step on, you telling hell, this belongs to me. You can get mad if you want to. God's enlarging my capacity. He's enlarging my territory. Watch me walk. Be seated. God, I've been preaching a long time. Sorry. There are times, just give me a few seconds. I'm going to try to just wrap this up. I've got eight minutes and 51 seconds. And I've only been on one point. 
there are times when there will only be the call that carries you. That's it. The need to see the manifestation will cause you to make moves that you don't need to make. But once you learn that the name is what he called me and I've got to stand in the name, let him supply the need, trust what he said, then there will be times when the call will be all you have. That's it. That's why you can't converse with everyone about the call. They will try to change your belief system. So you have to learn how to sit in the call, understanding that the call is what I need to master. The call is all I have. And if I can sit in the call, watch this. You will learn how to survive, point number two, seasons of impotency and infertility. If you learn how to sit in the call, sit in the name without worrying about the need, you will survive the seasons of impotency and the seasons of infertility, okay? The inability to produce at certain times of the year. Every church goes through them, every family goes through them, every company goes through them. Where there are seasons where things are stale or things are not moving or things are not swift as they normally are. And you have to learn how to survive that season. And, 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 and the thing about a season is that it's associated with a climate. When you're in a season, a climate comes with the season. So, and the season is just what it is. Somebody say, it is a season. That's the second thing you got to recognize. That when I'm going through a season, that's all it is, is a season. That it's a season, that means it comes in and it goes out. And if I understand the laws of the season, then I won't allow that climate to rest on me. That depression, that isolation, that mindset to rest on me in a permanent way because I know that it is just here for a little while. Now, the interesting thing about impotency is this, is that they survive the season of impotency. God allows them to get pregnant and then asks for the proof of the potency. Okay? What am I saying? He got her pregnant. This is the promise. And then God said, give me the promise, kill it. Are you here with me? This is all about learning to survive the season of impotency. Because God wants to, wants to know this. Once I answer your prayer about the inability to produce or the inability to make it happen, will you make it God? I like your church because they listen. I mean, like y'all are really listening. When, when, when you are going through impotency, infertility, in a business, in a church, in your family, metaphorically or in reality, that's difficult to deal with because you don't have the ability to make it happen. And so when God makes it happen and then God says, give it back to me, then you begin to question God. Because if you didn't staple in your belief system, God will ask you something that will make you say, this ain't God. That's why stapling in your belief system is number one. Because when you survive impotency and infertility, God will turn around and say, now give me the proof of your potency. And he tells him, sacrifice what I told you you could have. This is when you know you've gone to the next level. When you can take what you've been waiting on and obey God with whatever he requests of you. 
I thought I was here to preach it like crazy, but I'm here to teach it. I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. Because the next season in your life, it is not going to multiply if you don't give it. It is not going to explode if you don't sacrifice it. Because what you're telling God is, this is it. And God is saying, no, 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 there's more that I'm trying to teach you. No, God, I've been waiting for this. This is exactly what's going on. No, 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 no. I don't want you to make an idol out of this because you waited for so long to get it. And when we get what we waited for, we change. Oh, I hear somebody's mind right now. Look at somebody and tell them I'm not changing. The devil is a liar. When God kicks open this door, I'm going to give him whatever he asks. If he asks me to give it back, I'm going to give it back. I'm not going to make it a God. I'm not going to place it up above God. Whatever God says, that's what I'm going to. So he asked me proof of the potency. Give it back to me. And this is where we waver. Give it back. I waited a long time for this. Give it back. I need counseling. You had me wait 40 years for this. Give it back. But watch the text, Bishop. Y'all be seated. I'm almost done. I promise you. Six minutes and 23 seconds is what's on the screen. He said that he was unwavered. He was not wavered by unbelief. This is critical. Unbelief is atheism. Doubt, could have said doubt, but he didn't. Doubt is uncertainty. He says he was not wavered by unbelief. So that means that no matter what he went through, he never questioned if this was God. Are you here with me? Even when they went to Egypt in the drought, he never questioned if it was God. He just feared for his life. Even when Sarah did what she did with Hagar, it wasn't about questioning whether he was God or whether it, it was uncertainty. So all of us, sometimes, depending on the seat that we're in or whatever we are against, can be wavered by uncertainty. That is absolutely normal. The church has done a terrible job of making you feel like doubt is such a terrible thing. It is when it comes to believing in God, but you're uncertain about a whole lot of stuff. You're uncertain about your kid's future. You're uncertain about your career. You're uncertain about tomorrow. You're uncertain about whether we're going to make budget tomorrow or budget next year. That is a common thing. But what makes it difficult is when it is unbelief. Because when you're in unbelief, you block God from doing anything that he can do. Because you're telling God, I do not believe. And the scriptures said that Jesus himself could not do many things in Nazareth because. So when you step into unbelief, you're telling God, I'm just here, but I don't believe nothing you're saying. If we're going to be unwavered, the third and final thing. I've got to learn how to see the future in seed form. If you come, if you're waiting to see the seed, if you're waiting to see the future in a manifested form, then you're missing the process of God. Because God will drop a seed in your life and you'll miss it because your belief system is off. There's a seed sitting next to you. But because it don't look like manifestation, you'll treat it any kind of way. 
you'll look at that seed Nick, sitting next to you and say, I don't, I don't even know this person. Nigga. I'm not going to high five them. I'm not going to look at them. And that could be the next person that partners with you on a multi-million dollar deal. Yeah. Some of you have missed your future because you're too judgmental and you're too prejudiced and you're too religious and you got, you got a one way of viewing things and you can't see nothing but what you saw and God's trying to get you to see that it's not going to look like that. It's in seed form. So he tells Abraham, I'm going to make you father of many nations. And he tells Abraham, look up into the sky. Count the stars. And I want you to see that your seed's going to be just like this. But Abraham never saw that many stars. He hadn't even had one child. But if you don't learn how to see the nation in your child, you will miss the opportunity to raise something way above and beyond what you could ever think or imagine. Because there is more than just a man sitting next to you. There is more than just a woman sitting next to you. There is a nation sitting next to you. There is a nation that is sitting behind you. There is a nation that is in front of you. And if you don't pay attention to what God is doing, you will miss it because you're looking for big and the real big is small. Right now, next to you right now, I want you to lay your hands on that person. I don't know your COVID protocols. If you don't want to, that's fine. Just point at them. But I want you to lay your hands on that person if you can. Musician, I want you to play softly. Listen to me. Don't miss the future because you despise small beginnings. You want, it, you want it so big. And I know big is what we, that's what we preach. And he's going to do it. But you'll miss big because it starts small. And then it explodes. And you are holding the hand or you have your hand on someone who is a seed right now. You're a millionaire in seed form. Your business owner in seed form. Your nonprofit company, your LLC in seed form. That's you right now. There's multiple locations right in you right now. Your business is exploding inside the seed right now. Your gift is imploding inside the seed right now. And you have got to have an imagination that will allow you to see what God's trying to do inside so that you don't damage it and plant the seed in soil that it does not need. You cannot afford to plant yourself in an environment that is not conducive for what God's trying to do for your future. Don't drop yourself in crazy friendships. Don't drop yourself in bad business deals. Don't place yourself with people until you do your due diligence. I don't care if they're fine and if they're sexy and if they're rich. It doesn't matter. Do your homework before you drop your seed in there. You got to see the future. Now you're laying hands on that person. And if you're not going to pray for them, seriously, don't touch them. But if you're going to pray for them, I want you to take 90 seconds and I want you to open your mouth and begin to pray for what's getting ready to happen in their life right now. Come on, pray out loud. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Open your mouth. Pray. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Don't be too cool. Especially if you're holding your woman's hand. Let her hear you pray. 
turn that keyboard up. Come on. 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 That's it. Come on. 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 I see the future. Just keep playing with your plan. In your seat. See the future in your sea. I see the future in your sea. Come on, drummer. I see the future. And you're praying 30 more seconds. I see the future. Glory in your sea. That's it. Big, 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 big. I see the future. Here's what I want you to do. If what I just said registered with you and you want to walk into this season unwavered, when I count to three, I want you to get out of that chair, meet me right here at this altar. We're going to seal that thing. One, two, three, get up. Come, 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 I see the future. That's it, come on. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. 